authenticity today. Jesus was a real God who indwelt a real human body. He was authentic, and his life changed the world. Would you agree with me on that? Authentic Christians are people who buy into that with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength. And authentic Christians see him not as a religious figure, not as a guy who was really famous, but as Lord. Christians uh, celebrate him every week. We come here to celebrate him. But keep in mind that the enemy tries to hijack everything God does. Th think about it. Uh, Jesus, or God, made mankind to worship him. Ever since that time, the devil has been trying to get people to worship him. Christians began celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Sundays. The Jews met on Sabbath day. But the Christians changed their day of worship to Sunday. And you can read this in Scripture. In Revelation, it's called the Day of the Lord. Did you say that? The Day of the Lord. This is the Lord's Day. We celebrate His resurrection today. We celebrate what He did for us every single week. The first day of our week, just like we give our tithes first, because we recognize He provides for me, so I'm going to give my tithes first. We come on the first day of our week and we say, I'm going to block off some time just for him because I want to recognize him as my Lord and my Savior. Acts chapter 20 said they gathered on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 said they came together and gave their offerings on the first day of the week. Why were they doing that? Because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. You've probably noticed that the enemy has tried to steal the Lord's day. Now it's a day of sports, it's a day of beach, it's a day of, be, because it was protected for church and so most companies didn't make you work on Sundays, now it's a convenient day to do whatever you want, so most people have dropped their Lord and gone to the beach. They've gone fishing, they've gone, and there's nothing wrong with the beach or fishing as long as it's not taking the place of your Lord. So we come to this week, this is a special week on the calendar. This is the week of Good Friday and Easter. And it gives Christians, authentic Christians, an opportunity to witness to the world that we don't have any other time of the year, except for maybe Christmas. Now, the enemy has tried to corrupt these celebrations. And there are pagan things that have crept into the celebration of Christmas and of Easter. There are people who don't celebrate it right. But why should we let the enemy steal that day from us? It's still a day on the calendar where we can stop and say there was a, a Jesus, and he did die, and he was born, and he was. And so we celebrate his birth at Christmas, and we celebrate his resurrection at Easter, and the enemy's trying to shut us down so we don't even talk about him. And how he does that is he tries to corrupt the holiday. Well, you can have a corrupt Easter if you want, but I'm going to keep my Easter pure. I'm going to celebrate Easter the way it's supposed to be celebrated. I'm not going to stop just because you're doing it wrong. Just because my neighbor doesn't celebrate Christmas right doesn't mean I'm going to stop celebrating Christmas. And I understand that Easter is not necessarily the exact day that Jesus rose. Neither is Christmas the exact day that he was born. But I, I have some family members, uh, I have some friends who were born on Christmas, and so their family celebrates their birthday a week later or a week early. Who cares? Just give me my presents, right? That's all we care about. So we're not trying to figure out the exact day. It's just a chance to tell the whole world there was a real Jesus. And, and and he did come, and he did die, and so we're going to celebrate it. You can celebrate it however you want to. You can twist it however you want to. You can, you can mess it up however you want to. But as Christians, we're not going to be shut down and intimidated by all the bad things that are out there. We're still going to celebrate. We're going to come together and worship him. We're going to come together and declare what he did. We're going to tell our kids how he was born and how he died and how he rose again. And, and, and we're not going to let the enemy shut that down. 
because He's our Lord. We're going to celebrate Him. Our text this morning is going to come from the passion or the week of Jesus' death. And the setting is in the Last Supper. It's from Matthew chapter 26. Uh, That was supposed to already be up there. We celebrate Easter every Sunday morning when we come together and worship him. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, 21 through 25. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me, and this is Jesus talking. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, Is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Judas went to church. Judas went out to eat with Jesus. Judas had a front row seat to everything Jesus did. And yet somehow his mindset allowed him to betray his Lord. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. We want to honor you in everything we do. We want to declare you in our life. We want to share you with the world. But most of all, we want to make sure that you are Lord and you rule in our lives, that you have the last say say in everything we do, God. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to begin just by talking about the dangers of counterfeit. There's some counterfeit things that are just irritating. Like if you bought a Rolex that didn't turn out to be a Rolex. Or if you bought a handbag in downtown New York somewhere and come to find out it really wasn't the brand that it said on, on the... You know, that's irritating. That's counterfeit. But then there are some counterfeits that get more dangerous. Like when er- Bernie Madoff acted like he had real investments and he took billions of dollars and he scammed people. And he, there are some people that had thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars set aside for retirement who are now completely broke. That's not just irritating. That is cruel. But then there are counterfeits that can actually be deadly. Medicine is one of those. Last November, a counterfeit intelligence bureau reported on a case in Panama where 43 people had died after they consumed some counterfeit medicine. New York Times conducted an investigation into that that tragedy, and they found out the cause was there was an ordinary uh, cough syrup that the government of Panama produced. And the, the problem was they wanted to save some money. So they took a, one ingredient and they substituted it. Uh, there's a harmless and, and commonly used ingredient called glycerin, which was usually in cough syrups. Instead, they took diethylene glycol and they put it in this place. Well, glycerin is used in a lot of sweeteners and things like that. (coughs) Diethylene is a more uh, commonly used part of solvents and additives to products like brake fluid and antifreeze. So depending on the amount of volume that's consumed, it can have negative impact on your body, like it uh, can cause kidney failure, it can shut down your nervous system, it can cause para- paralysis or death. And so since November in Panama, there's been 100 people die because they took this cough syrup. Now our government is so concerned about things like that, tainted foods and drugs, that we have what is called the Food and Drug Administration. And the Food and Drug Administration employs 15,000 people. It has a budget of over $5 billion every year. They have 223 field offices and 13 laboratories in the 50 United States. And we even have people in Puerto Rico, 
in Virgin Islands, in China, in India, Costa Rica, Chile, Belgium, and the United Kingdom. All because we're aware that somebody wanting to cut corners will take something counterfeit and put it into our medicine and people will die. Turn to your neighbor and say, counterfeit's bad. But Jesus was the real deal. Jesus was not counterfeit. Jesus was not a scam. Jesus was not just a teacher trying to raise money for his organization. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh dwelling among us. And he stood out because he was the first authentic Christian. We call ourselves Christians because we're following Christ. And he, he stood out amongst a bunch of phony believers, amongst a bunch of bad reporters, and amongst a bunch of crooked politicians. Just like you and I have the opportunity to do today. <clears throat> and they killed him for it. They killed it. That, that's what we talk about on Good Friday. They killed Jesus. And in doing so, they helped Jesus change the world. Jesus did it perfectly. Jesus did everything he was supposed to do. He was as authentic as they come. And all of the disciples followed him all but one. What was his name? Judas. Although the disciples kind of staggered, especially through the crucifixion in those days when Jesus was in the tomb, although they didn't do it perfectly, all of them except for Judas eventually died for him. They were the real deal. I believe there's some authentic Christians in this room. I think there's some authentic Christians that are listening to this today. And the key to authenticity is not how many hours you pray every day. It's not how many T's you cross and how many I's you dot. The key to authentic Christianity is lordship. What's the key to authentic Christianity? Is he your Lord? If he's really your Lord, then it'll cause you to dot I's and cross T's. It'll cause you to spend time with him. But you can, spend, you can be religious without him being your Lord. That's what Judas did. So the scripture, scripture tells us that one of Judas' problem was love for money, right? But his problem was deeper than that. And I want to show you how that works. We can get a hint of that as we go back to our text. And that's me, okay. Matthew 26, we just read it. There were two questions, all right? In the top half there, all of the disciples said to him, uh, Lord, and that means, curi that from the Greek is curio, curio, and it means supreme in authority, controller, God. So the 11 said to Jesus, God, controller of my life, supreme authority in my life, is it me? They were on the altar at service time saying, Almighty God, I want to make sure everything's okay. Is not me? I, I, I'll take any kind of correction. I'll, I'll listen to anything you want me to listen to. I'll, I'll change anything. You, Lord, I really want you to touch me down deep. But Judas said something else. He said, Rabbi, is it I? And that word rabbi means teacher. So what Judas was able to do is bring it down into the everyday ordinary realm. Okay, you're a teacher, you're a really smart guy. You know, is it me? You know, what do you think? You know, let me get your opinion on this man, Jesus. You know, you're a really nice guy, really enjoyed being with you, but I don't really think you're God. I really don't think you're my Lord. And people come to church and do that. They'll sit in sermons and they'll argue with the teacher. God will send a word to them and they'll argue with him as if they'll change his mind like, God's a little bit slow. I think I need to inform him about a few things. Well, that's because he's not your Lord. If you're, argue, if you're trying to get God to change his mind on a lot of things, then you probably don't have respect for him as Lord. Why do you even want to go to heaven? If somebody who's dumber than you is running that, why do you want to go there? Why do you want to live forever with someone who's too clueless? But if he's Lord... 
And I need to hang on to every word he says. I need to not mouth back. I need to shut up sometimes and just let him speak. I need to sit there and, and put my mind, mind and my stronghold aside and say, I had an opinion, and now it sounds like that's not your opinion, and I'm not going to argue with you because you're God and I'm not. I'm not going to put you in the category that Judas put you in and just argue, this is just a philosophy. Oh, that's your denominational idea. Oh, that's just a doctrine. If, if you just get into all of that, there's, you can make a case for absolutely anything in the world. But you get face to face with Jesus. You look into his eyes. You let him speak into your heart. You get honest with him. You get vulnerable with him. You let him minister to you. And he'll tell you two or three times through two or three different sources. But I've seen so many people begin to try to figure out how can I have my cake and eat it too? How can I be a Christian and go to heaven and not make him Lord? There are two ways that you can live life. You can read scriptures, you can pray, you can listen to a sermon in this way. Search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. You are my Lord and my God. Or you can search it and study it and argue with it and try to make it fit your point of view and not make him Lord. Maybe it seems oversimplified, but I, I think you can probably simplify everything down to this. Is he your Lord? Some people argue about eternal salvation, like when you're born again, you're born again forever, and you're once saved, always saved. I don't have time to go into the whole doctrine. But I really believe we don't have to be afraid of losing our salvation if he's Lord. But this is a relationship. And God can't be your Lord if you don't make him your Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, there are those who argue with God like Judas did. And they become so blind that they cannot even see. And by the time those blinders fall off, they've already messed their life up and they feel so bad that they want to take their own life. Lordship is the key. Judas was so stubborn, he was so strong-willed. You know people like that, don't you? And although he, unlike the others, personally confirmed with Jesus that he was the one, he, he said, Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, you said it. This might be classified as the dumbest thing anybody ever did. They were with God in flesh. It had been prophesied that someone would betray him. He sat at dinner and said, one of you will betray me. He, he looked at Jesus and said, teacher, is it I? The teacher said, you said it. And he went out and did it. What a bonehead. Sounds like me sometimes. I say, God, give me direction. I go to church and they preach on it. I walk away and say, oh, that's probably right, but, uh, you know, Maybe I'll go on Facebook and pe see what people say. Bonehead. Well, yeah, I, I know uh, it was kind of weird that I prayed about it and then someone said something. Kind of weird that happened, uh, but I don't know if they're right. What does God have to do? What would God have had to do to Judas to help him? He just wasn't his Lord. Jesus was not Judas' Lord. That, that's, it's, it's as simple as that. His pride propelled him forward, and this proud, crafty guy became a loser of all losers. He's probably the most recognized loser in all of history. Now, this is a very painful part of backsliding that, from my vantage point, I've watched people do. Bump your neighbor and say, now he's talking to me, not you. God uses a sermon. He uses a counseling session. You go to your pastor and you say, Pastor, give me some counsel. He gives you some counsel and you say, oh, I don't know if I want. Why did you even bother? If you don't think that I'm going to hear from God and help you, don't come to me. Please don't waste my time. But if, 
he's really Lord, God will give you counsel through people that you submit to. You got to do something about it, though. You go get counsel and then you don't do anything about it, and then you're mad that your life doesn't turn out. Well, you're the one that didn't do anything about it. Judas could have had a whole different story. He had every opportunity. And I've seen God use people. Uh, I've seen. I've seen people. In fact, I've talked to people, and I've seen them slipping away from His lordship. And I've said, "Hey." Your life is proving right now that you don't really make him Lord. And they'll look, they've looked right at me and said, I know it's wrong, but I just want to do this. Now, I can't heal stupid. I can't preach enough to help stupid. If, if you know better than God Almighty, some of us just have that stubborn streak in us, but stop and think about that stubbornness. Judas just thought he knew better. Judas just, instead of taking it as a word from God, instead of being able to hear from God through Jesus, who was God, he argued with him as a teacher. If you ever turn church and just, well, this is just what we believe, we come together and discuss different doctrines. If you don't really believe God is real and he's impacting our life, if you really don't believe that the Holy Spirit is God in you, then you're no different than any other religion in the world. But we have the real thing, God. God has given us an authentic thing. You have the real God inside of you, as was mentioned. You have real direction from God. His word will speak to you. His church will minister to you. But you're the one that has to not be stubborn when it comes to you. It's not so much about what people are doing, like they used to not do this and then used to not do this, and now they're doing that. It's really not about what they're doing. What they're doing, they're doing because of their attitude. Now, he's no longer Lord. God has stopped being their Lord. So usually it shows up, people start arguing about doctrines and standards. Why is it always standards? Well, how come we can't do this and how come we can't do that or whatever? Uh, The real question is, is he your Lord? When you start wanting to nitpick, well, can I do that or can I do this or whatever, it's like like if, if I did that with my wife. Okay, she's my wife, right? Well, you know, uh, could I hug the neighbor's wife? I won't go to bed with her, but could I hug the neighbor's wife and kiss her? And you know, she's not good, no, she's not negotiating on that. Because if if she's really the love of my life, I'm not going to want to hug the neighbor's wife. So why do I want to dress like the world? Why do I want to please people who are out there? Because he's not my lord. And I can make arguments, and I can go find books written on your church doesn't teach right or whatever. You can find anything you want nowadays on all that. I, it doesn't really matter. The question is, do you believe you're going to live forever? And who do you believe you're going to stand before? And if, if it's him that you're going to stand before, then why are you checking out the website across town, across the country? Go talk to your Lord. Ask him what to do. If you'll be honest, he'll talk to you about it. Judas probably thought he was being this brave, intelligent guy. I'm not duped by all this, boy. Uh, You know, many people finally choose badly because they they convince themselves that they just know better than everybody else. They just settle on a philosophy that matches their heart, and their heart is saying, he's no longer my Lord. So I want you to think about this this week as we celebrate Jesus' death and his resurrection. The day Jesus conquered flesh was the day that Judas was conquered by flesh. Jesus was in the garden saying, not my will but thine be done. Judas was saying, teacher, I need to do some mental gymnastics so I can go ahead with this. So, you know, I'm going to pretend like I prayed about this. I'm going to pretend like I got counsel on this. I'm going to pretend like I really repented. I'm going to go through the motions of all that and then go ahead and do my own thing. The day Jesus conquered flesh, Judas was conquered by flesh. And that day probably felt terrible for Jesus, but it probably for a few minutes felt good for Judas. He goes and makes 30 pieces of silver. He feels like he's doing something noble. I don't know what what his head, but... 
I, I've seen enough people, and I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I'm trying to help somebody. Usually when people are trying to get out of their relationship with their wife or their husband or their Lord, they start making excuses. They start figuring out, well, this isn't fair. Or why did this not happen? Or, you know, they didn't do this right or all that kind of stuff. And, and Judas was in that, that, that place that night. But I've seen people who've left living for God, and now suddenly they, they say they feel free. Have you ever talk to somebody? They leave lordship, and so now they can do whatever they want. It's like, if, if I left my wife, I could feel like, ooh, now I can just go hook up with anybody. There's a freedom to that. But I just forfeited the best relationship of my life. So when people leave lordship so they can go do whatever they want to do, whatever makes sense to them, they go make their own religion up, right? They're not being honest with God. They're making up their own religion. Then, then there's no longer any lordship there, and there's a temporary feeling of freedom. But just like Judas, it catches up with you. Once Judas left his lord and made Satan his lord, Satan entered into him, and it was just a few hours of that, and he was hanging from a tree. From my vantage point, I've seen people, like I said, who say, I want to do this. I've seen other people who just would not be convinced. They, it, they turned it into an argument between me and them. I was trying to stand there and argue to help them see his point of view, and they made it about me and him or me and the church. It's never about you and the church. It's about you and your lordship. The church is there to help you with that lordship business. Is that making sense to anybody? But enough on the negativity. Everyone say there's hope. This may not look like hope, but Scripture says, We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. There's only one way to solve this dilemma. That is honesty. That is simple repentance. That is resetting. That is restarting. That is accepting forgiveness and moving on. If God has convicted you, even in this sermon here today, in just a minute, you're going to have a chance to make all that right. That's completely fixable. What's not, a fi not fixable is if you're going to go away from here with your own opinions and your own stubbornness. It's okay if you go away from here imperfect. It's just not okay if you go away from here without him being Lord. Anybody want him to be your Lord? Because none of us do this perfectly. There are times when I crowd Jesus out of the driver's seat. There are days when my flesh gets irritated with his lordship. There are days that I don't want to be a pastor. There are days that I don't want to be a Christian. There are days that I don't want to do the right thing. There are days I don't want to treat somebody who just mistreated me in a Christian manner. I, I'll just tell you that, all right? You don't have to see it. Just take my word for it. It happens. I don't do this perfectly. I have to keep on top of it. Like I talked about last time I preached. I have to be aware of the creep. Because it, it just happens like this. I just don't want to get out of bed early enough to pray. I, I just cut my prayer life down from once a day to twice a week. After all, my teacher should really understand my schedule. My teacher would. My Lord wouldn't. I just naturally want to put myself first. So that's why I have daily prayer. That's why I hold myself to coming on the first day of the week every week. Because I know if I don't hold myself to that, before you know it, I just have church with Jesus in the mountains, and I'd never go to church. But I want to be authentic. Do you? You know what? There's so much beauty in true lordship. I want to talk about that for a minute. A lot of times all we hear is, you better make him lord, you better make him lord. But it was already touched on today, so you know this isn't just me, this is God trying to say something. There's a beauty in making him your lord. How many of you have ever kind of been drifting and you were brought to a sermon or to uh, an altar or a prayer meeting 
and you, you just finally got real with God again. You say, okay, God, I admit I've been playing games with you. I'm just going to get real with you. Sorry I was such a jerk. I'm sorry I messed up. I recognize I messed up. I come to you and I repent. I, I'm willing to give it all again. And I, I feel like this is the hundredth time I've said this, but I'm going to give it all again. And push through, and God refreshes you with the Spirit. And when it's done, it's almost like there's this, this peace, this, oh, everything's okay. What happened? He's Lord again. That love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, mercy, kindness, that, that comes from Him. And when he's not Lord, it can't flow in my life. But when he's Lord again, it's not about how good I am. It's not how perfect I'm running. It's about how much he's my Lord. I can stumble three times and get back up and make him Lord again. I can mess up a dozen times and make him Lord again. I can do everything perfectly and him not be Lord. It's not about your deeds. It's about your relationship with your God. Is he your Lord? When he's your Lord, there's no duplicity. You don't have to go to prayer and flatter him. Like, you're a really good God. And, you know, I really love you. And you've done some awesome things. And yay, 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 yay. Uh, because I'm about to ask you for something. So I'm going to really butter you up real good here. Not when he's Lord. When he's Lord, he knows what you need before you even have need, ask him for it. And you go to him with a genuine Oh, God, you've been so good to me. Thank you so much for what you've done in my life. And if you never do something for me, and anything else for me, you still deserve all my honor. You still deserve all the praise I can give you. You have saved me, and you're forever my Lord. That's what will make you an authentic Christian. Some of, you, some of us try to be a Christian by just being good, and we wear ourselves out because it doesn't work. You have to let him be Lord, and then he helps you be good. That honesty is what looses him to help you in your life. If you try to be good and please the church and please the pastor and please your family and make everybody think you're a holy person without him being Lord, you'll be miserable. But if you'll just get honest with him and make him your Lord, you'll, you'll abs accidentally do more good stuff than you were before, and it won't, you won't feel drained all the time trying to be a good person. If he's really your Lord, there's not... These undercurrents of doubt and fear, it's like, what if, he di what if I died? Am I going to go to heaven? And, and what if this happens? What if this happens? Well, he's your Lord. If you've gone to all the trouble of making him Lord, you think he's going to let you die in a wreck that he doesn't want you to die in? You think he's going to let somebody ruin your career that he doesn't want to let ruin the career? If your career is ruined, maybe he needs to change your career. But God's never caught blindsided. He's ne never caught short. His arm is never short. If, if you make him your Lord, you can have a confidence. You can live honestly. Every time you come to church, you don't have to worry about what's going to be preached today because you're, you're an open book. You can be honest with the people you live with. You don't have to pretend that you love Jesus and then do all of your fun stuff on the side where no one's looking. You're just honest. When you mess up, you tell them, I messed up, pray for me, help me, uh, but I'm going to be honest. When, when you really make him your Lord, you can be bold, when you pray, and you can be intimate when you pray. When I come to God, I don't have to come to him and, and say, would you pretty please let me do this, or would you pretty please do this in my life? And, uh, and secretly I'm thinking, but I don't really want to give you everything. Making a deal here. Would you bless me? I know you've asked me to be wholehearted, but, but I know I'm not, and I don't really plan on being wholehearted, but would you bless me anyway? It's this messed up relationship. But if you can just be honest with God, and you, then you can go boldly to him and say, you know what, you are my provider. And if I don't need this, then I'm okay with that. I want to tell you about it, but I'm okay if you give it. I'm okay if you don't give it. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's just, I can be intimate with him. Have you ever tried to be with, intimate with somebody that you're cheating on? I, I hope we won't apply this to marriages right now, but... Let's, let's take something else. If you really have been doing something your boss asked you not to do and you walk into his office and you're in this conversation, there's always this undercurrent. I wonder if he knows. I wonder if he's going to find out. I wonder if he's not saying yes because he knows of that. And we, lead, we live, these, live these complicated lives. We can't be honest and open with people because 
we're posturing, we're pretending, we're working them, we're manipulating them, we're seeing how we can get away with everything that we want to get away with. But when he's our Lord, when, when our boss is our boss, it changes everything. And then there's that everlasting grace-based joy. It says, you know what? I trust you enough that I'm going to let go of everything you say to let go of, and I'm going to hold on to you, and you're going to be my strength, my grace, my help, my joy. Would you stand with me? Authentic Christians make him Lord. You'll see the crowd thin out when God asks for sacrifice. A lot of people who say they're Christians, but when it's time to uh, give in a special offering, or when God asks them to dress differently, or when God, I'm not saying when the church asks them, I'm saying when God tries to come and convict them about something, when, when a prayer meeting is called where they don't see how they're going to get anything out of it. It's just going to be a lot of work praying for the lost. Suddenly, they have so many things to do, and they're legitimate things to do, and the crowd thins out. Because a whole lot of people call him their Lord that don't really make him their Lord. But I believe you are trying to make him your Lord. And I think God's trying to take us to the place where you stop feeling pressure from the church or from your loved ones. They're they're supposed to help you move the right direction. But please don't do what you do to make me happy. Do what you do because you love him. Do what you do because he's the one who's directed you down that path. Do what you do because you're honest with him, and that's where he's led you to do. Our story began... With Judas saying, teacher, instead of Lord. And this is how it ended for Judas. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. And they bound him and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I have sinned, he declared. I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. And Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. The option is to do what the rest of them did. They called him Lord, and then they even denied him, and they hid, and they were afraid, but they kept him as their Lord. And Scripture says in Revelation, when John's about to die, he sees the vision, he says, of heaven. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Hmm. Who made the better choice? A feeling of relief and 30 pieces of silver for a few hours and then suicide and eternal damnation? Because he got to do what he wanted to do. Or lordship that caused each one of those disciples to die for him. And their their names are written in the foundations of heaven, and they're forever and ever with him. And you can argue for that deal if you want. Like I said, I can't help stupid. God can't help stubborn. God can help almost anything but stubborn. Because stubborn means you think you know better than God. Maybe today is the day to fix this. If you think anything is out of order, I'm going to open this altar right now, and I'm going to ask you to come. And it's not going to take long. It doesn't take long to be honest. It just takes courage. Before you decide anything, before you proceed with anything in your life, I wonder if you'd just take a few minutes and you would talk honestly and openly that you'd be truly repentant. This isn't between you and me. This is between you and Jesus. This isn't between you and the church. This is between you and Jesus. This is between you and your Lord. 
Everyone in this room has an opportunity to walk out those doors guilt-free, shame-free, doubt-free, fear-free. Everyone in this room has the opportunity to leave here saying, it really doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm on my way to heaven, and I have this eternal relationship with an almighty God, and he's going to take care of me. Or you can leave arguing, stubborn. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't know if that's right. And I, you, know, don't, you don't have to agree with me. Just agree with him for a few minutes. You don't have to do what I say. Just, just go talk to him. Hello, I'm Bishop John Hansen, and I oversee Acts 2 Ministries of Taunton, Connecticut. I'd like to thank you for watching Authentic Christianity. We've designed these 45 minutes for the purpose of inspiring and challenging you to explore the original beliefs that were taught in the first century by Jesus and his disciples. There's nothing that will change a person's life more than the discovery and implementation of God's principles. Please let us know if we can help you in your pursuit of truth. The sermons you're watching were taped live at Acts 2 Ministries. Our church is a multicultural, multi-generational body of believers from a variety of occupations, economic backgrounds, cultures, and communities throughout southern New England. Many of us came from situations that were dysfunctional and daunting, but God has changed our lives. We're excited about the many people whose lives are being transformed as they embrace the same tenets of faith and lifestyle that was embraced by first century Christians whose story has been recorded in the New Testament book of Acts. Now, we realize that some of you may want to join us in person or watch other online sermons. So, for information about our location and ministries, to access online sermons and other helpful resources, or to contact us, please visit us online at www.actsii.org. Now, I'll be the first to admit that it can be confusing for someone who's trying to determine what is really true or how God expects them to live out their faith. There's so many churches and philosophies claiming to be right, and churches are made up of imperfect people. But please, don't be discouraged in your quest for truth. God will respond to those who sincerely seek Him. And what He will do in your life, if you obey His leading, will be well worth all the effort. In fact, this program may be God's way of answering some of your prayers. The messages presented here on Authentic Christianity are designed to help you find your own personal encounter with God and to help you find a biblical faith that's grounded in scripture rather than traditions, denominations, opinions, or creeds. We will deal with a wide range of topics including salvation, healing, recovery, how to receive the Holy Ghost, spiritual gifts, prophecy, and other everyday Christian living topics. Our goal is to help you move forward in your relationship with God so you can experience the abundant life He promised to those who obey Him. For those of you who would like to visit Acts 2 Ministries, our Sunday morning service begins at 10 a.m. and ends around noon. Our service will include vibrant prayer, exuberant singing, anointed preaching, and opportunities to respond to what's preached. While many who attend dress in their Sunday best, others choose to dress business or more casual. And during that time, we provide classes for the children between the ages of 18 months and 12 years old. Now, during the week, we meet from house to house for what we call an hour of prayer and care. These small group prayer meetings allow people to ask questions, minister to one another, and pray for one another. They also provide us with an opportunity to reach out to people who may not be a part of our assembly. We have groups in 12 different communities in our region. And you can find more information about prayer groups on our website. Then, on Friday nights, we offer a youth program for young people 13 years and older. This is a great chance for young people to enjoy teaching and good, clean fun in a supervised environment. You can find specific information on our website calendar. Once again, thank you for watching. We're praying for you 
as you pursue truth.